What's up, Jacob Evans here, and today I'm joined by Nate from the 8020 Drummer. So if you haven't heard of Nate already, definitely go to his channel. He's been making excellent drum education videos for a really, really long time. And uh, yeah, super stoked to have him here, and we're just gonna have a chat about some of the problems and, and you know, the, the, the meta of like modern kind of drum education. Uh, so thanks for being here, Nate. It's great to great to have you on. My pleasure. Let's do it. Let's offend everybody on the internet. <laughs> so as it stands right now, I want to get your kind of thoughts on what you think is kind of the the state of like modern drum drum education. Obviously, particularly in the online space, but just in general. Top of my head, I would say. There's one kind of main thing that occurs to me, which is that drum lessons in this day and age is a system with a lot of good people defying their incentives. And by that, I mean that my drum lesson, ex drum lesson experience coming up was mostly decent, although there was a little like play the book every week. But there were a couple of teachers who, who defied that. Mm. And... The experiences I hear of a lot of my students and people who come through my programs is the opposite. They'll just describe like, we're learning the same thing every week. I have to play on the pad for two years before they let me touch the kit. And we can get into this, but it's pretty easy to see when you think about the incentives for teachers and for book publishers and for everything else, why that's the state of being. What are the possible causes for that, do you think? Like, what do you think are some of the, the pitfalls of, let's take like traditional lessons, like one-on-one -on -one lessons or even, um, mm -hmm. that create that or that don't necessarily produce the result, uh, the desired result? It's often a cognitive dissonance for a student to understand why conventional drum lessons are the way they are if they don't work. So there's kind of a feeling like, well, everybody teaches this way, so they wouldn't be doing it this way if it didn't work. And by and large, like when people get to you or me, they're already kind of understanding that, you know, I've been doing this for 15 years. It hasn't served me super well, so I'm ready to try something else. But for the public at large, maybe the people listening to this video, the people who, who may be would be skeptical of your side or mine in favor of just some more mainstream stuff like, hey, everybody goes to this big drum brand. Why would I mm. care about somebody who's taking a different approach? I think that's that's opening the door to the discussion that we want to have today, which is like, why? So if if mainstream sort of music music storefront drum lessons didn't evolve to be the way they did because they're the most adaptive way to create great players, then why did they? And that's when you sort of get into the, the game theory of mm. what incentives the teacher has and what incentives the publisher has, et cetera, et cetera. I think one really sort of simple and yet like not necessarily commonly talked about factor in that is, I mean, is the monetary uh, incentive of just paying an hourly rate it's like when you're when you're paying an hourly rate to someone you know whatever it is 60 100 bucks an hour or whatever it is to have lessons the 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 teacher benefits by the process taking longer <laughs> you know like exactly. directly and mm -hmm. and then you can um and i think you've sort of talked about this before we've talked about it like you end up with this sort of carrot on a stick you know, phenomenon of like, oh, the thing that, you know, the, the real medicine is like just around the corner, you know, it's like, but, but like you said, but we've got to do, you know, we've got to do the pad work first and we've got to do this and we've got to do that. And I think that it's a really small, um, it's a really small thing, but, but it, it definitely plays a big role in the development of the student, you know, and it's such a simple uh, thing. And it's something that when, when I personally started to deviate from that, at least in the structure of my program and stuff, I had never thought that there was any other way. Like it was just kind of like, oh, that's, that's what you do. You know, you, you charge an hourly or you charge like a subscription or whatever. And, and that's just 
but we, we just do that because, you know, and, and I think that that falls under a larger umbrella of so much a part of drum education in general falls under that sort of, well, this is how it's always been done umbrella, you know, of the books that are almost 100 years old and, and the, the resources that are pretty dated at this point, you know, and, and sort of serve a different generation of drummer, but there's still a lot of dogma that surrounds using them, you know? So, um, yeah, I think that kind of dogmatism or just, yeah, that dogmatism seems very rife, I, I find, in, in, the, in the industry. So to boil it down, to boil it right down, the teacher has an incentive to make it easy for him or herself to, they don't want to invent a custom curriculum for every student, especially at the rates they're getting paid, right? 25 bucks an hour. And they also have an incentive to keep you coming, whether or not that's conscious, probably they want to see you make results, but it's, it's great if you don't have people, you know, in, in the software industry, they call it churn. And it's, it's looked down on. You want to minimize your churn. Like the, yeah, the yeah. longer you can retain people in your monthly recurring revenue or whatever, the better. And so if you just look at one thing, it's like everyone started drum lessons playing on the pad. And practically everyone had their teacher dangle the kit over them as a mm. carrot. Like if, if you get through this book or you get through these two books on the pad, you get through stick control, you get through Tony Cerrone, whatever else, th then we'll will play the kit. Mm -hmm. My guess is a lot of those teachers don't even know why they were doing it. It's because their teacher did it for them. Tr trust me, at some point, there was some slick capitalist <laughs> in a sport coat with a cigar who, who thought the, these teachers are going to want a reason for their students to keep coming back. And if you mm -hmm. give them the kit right away, then maybe they'll like it, maybe they won't. But hey, open loop, you hold that kit out two years in the future, by the time you get there, you've got two years of sunk cost. I don't think I'm being super conspiratorial about this. It's more that just over time, over thousands of people, obviously these, these subtle incentives wear a groove. I was gonna add to that, like, I agree. I, I don't think it's necessarily the case that there's like, you know, the, all the, the evil <laughs> drum teachers being like, mm, how can I get them to, yeah, like it's, it's not happening like that. But, but I think that particularly when you talk about money, it's like the incentive is that people, you know, teachers that make a living from it, you know, so that you like, you got to eat, right? You like, you got to figure out ways for it to be um, sort of viable, um, long term so i think pricing like pricing structure um it does play a it does play a big role you know i think um you know one thing that i've certainly experienced um because because i use a bit of a like i guess a non-conventional pricing structure where i actually work with people over a longer period of time it, it did two things that were sort of un unexpected uh, side effects of that were, was firstly there's you know when you sort of people commit to a longer study period they, they tend to it tends to sort of filter out uh, people who, who really want to do it you know so that there's a much higher um, you know people are practicing and they're, and they're doing it because they because they're because they they're really incentivized to do it but the other side of it is it it's made sort of makes me a better teacher because I'm like oh man that like um, you know, we're working towards this kind of result, we're working towards this end result, and it's really like, it incentivizes you to really think about not so much the time, but like, well, how do I produce the result in this person now? How can I bring them from, from A to B? And I think just in, in, a, in a broader sort of uh, approach in, in that topic, I think that that's the best possible scenario for both the student and the teacher is when you, the teacher, are primarily concerned with the result. You know, how can I actually make this person better? You know, <laughs> and like, and then, and then uh, structuring everything sort of around that, you know, whether it's pricing or format or whatever it may be. Um, yeah, so there are a couple layers to this onion. What, one is, if we know the failure modes for traditional music teaching, if you wanted to 
align the incentives better for a student who wanted to get the maximum value and be sure that the teacher was was the best motivated to teach him or her to the best of his or her ability to go the extra mile to to not cut corners but but to only to only succeed when the student succeeded you know the the mediocre answer to that is the college teaching studio where the teachers get paid whether the students do well or not so mm. in in that case as a professor you're no longer incentivized to keep them coming back you're actually incentivized to wash them out and get somebody better in because you're getting paid, paid either way for that time so you'd rather have somebody who doesn't make you want to die but better than that still is is the coaching model where you you succeed if your students succeed um so so you've you've set up something quite nice and it's, it's something i'm in the background trying to trying to duplicate to some degree uh for my 80 20 folks where you guys agree on a result they they screen for their level um you agree on a price and then the most valuable thing for you at the end of that process is the the testimonial or the before and after video so that 100%. regardless of what the content is which we can talk about like whether it's you know one of my automated courses or your coaching thing or like john mm -hmm. riley or, or or somebody else like at, at the very least like those incentives are aligned and if you're a yeah. student you know just top of my head you would you would want to look for a situation where the teacher succeeds to the degree you succeed especially if you're re you're really serious about getting better you don't just want someone to flatter you and bullshit you and tell you you're getting better when you're not or mm. waste both of your time just so that you can kill 30 minutes each week yeah yeah exactly um I guess I, I'm really curious to get your thoughts on the, you know, and this is obviously um, something that's very common now, which is sort of a, another uh, form of uh, teaching or learning is the subscription model. You know, it seems to be something that's very common. You know, you pay whatever it is, 20, 30 bucks a month or whatever, and you, you get access to some kind of uh, subscription. Um, what do you think about that? what as a as a teaching mode i think it's going to be dubious in its usefulness to any but the most motivated student so say you have a curated library of materials some some membership systems even have like a, a wizard that guides people through level by level and kind of gamifies things be that as it may, the the monthly recurring thing is a different a different thing from that. Where so in my courses, I have self directed courses where they're not cheap, but they're also not crazy expensive. The idea is for them to be affordable for an average college student and and to be a replacement. In the case the student's motivated enough to be self-directed for maybe six months worth of lessons or a, a, a teachable course on a workout routine or something you would take on Skillshare to improve your video, video editing chops. And even in those cases, I'm sanguine that probably 20 to 25 percent of the students will actually be motivated enough to force themselves into the shed have the focus to stick with it every time i mm. think when you when you add on top of that the monthly recurring thing and again then there's an incentive to keep the student in the program agnostic to its continued utility to the student then you're no longer necessarily talking about utility you're talking about ethics and and i will say that at the price point that a lot of these memberships charge it's actually competitive with something like netflix or hbo max so mm. i'm willing to set the bar for some of these big commercial drum sites we all know and love fairly low in terms of if that student is entertained and gets some enjoyment a few times a week out of it for mm. whatever 32 39 a month which is like paying for both showtime and hbo 
there are some live streams. They, yeah. they hire world-class names to go live with these people. I, if people want to spend their money that way and it enriches their lives, I'm not going to critique it. What I will say is if you're the student looking for quick improvement, that's probably not the the way that's going to get you there fastest. Mm. Just it, It's like walking into a, a box gym as a novice. So it's like I can go into Blink, and because I've worked with trainers for years, even though it doesn't look like it at all, I I, I know what to do, and I'm I'm yeah I, I have self motivation or whatever. But but walk into walk into Blink or walk into an Equinox day one, and you don't have a trainer. Number one, you're going to wash out quickly. But number two, you're definitely going to waste a lot of time and maybe injure yourself. Um, mm. And it's the same thing. It's like if if you're a drummer who wants to get to the next level in a finite period of time, the, the, how do I put this? I don't want to say bargain basement. I don't want to say one size fits all mass market. The mass yeah. market membership site is, is not going to be the most optimal tool to get you there. In my opinion. Yeah. Something else I wanted to ask you about was, um, you know, I'm sure you've experienced this, uh, also, but, you know, when you go and you book a lesson with someone who you look up to, someone, you know, with a big name or something and, and who's, who's a fantastic player, and then you have the lesson only to sort of realize that it's, it wasn't very good, you know, and maybe it's one of those lessons where someone's just like, yeah, it's just, it's just the vibe, you know, you just, you just do it. And I know when that happened to me, I sort of walked away sort of, thinking that I had done something wrong or like I had not asked the right questions or sort of got the information out of that person the right way. Um, but now sort of a lot, many years later, I, I realized that, you know, it, it wasn't the case. It was more so the fact that not necessarily all great players are, are great teachers, you know? <laughs> and um, yeah, have you, have you experienced that before? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, of course. And I think I think what's going on is to, to be a to be a great teacher and to be a trustworthy source are two different things. So you'll always be able to sell drum lessons on the internet if you're sponsored by one of the big symbol brands and you've been in Gospel Chops videos since 2005. Because everybody assumes that being a great player equates to being a great teacher. And I think that's partly right. I think that you wouldn't want to trust somebody to take you on a journey unless they'd been there themselves. So that's why I think you and I both put our playing front and center on our channel. And I think it is important for a, a prospective student to look at what I'm doing and where you, what you're doing and saying, has this person been to where I want to go? And maybe they haven't. Like there are definitely some people who are at a level where they'll see my playing and think, nah, I'd, I'd rather study with Mason Guidry, you know, but there, there's, that's, you know, that's a very, very small percentage. The, the vast majority of people who, who know their own ability are, how do I put it? The, the, the tail end of the bell curve is small. So there are just a far greater number of students who are kind of at that intermediate level, but mm. So, so you need you need a degree of having been down the road past past where the student has, so that you can communicate to them what it feels like. But the other side of that equation is understanding how learning works. And just because you can chop doesn't mean you know anything about deliberate practice or accelerated learning or learning psychology or why drilling works in what situations, why it doesn't et cetera, et cetera. Mm. And I think that's crystal clear when you look at things like sports coaches. It's like no one would expect Tom Brady to be able to do Bill Belichick's job overnight. Like you'd expect mm. Tom Brady after 15 or 20 years of experience to be able to do it, but you understand there's a learning curve between being able to throw the football and knowing what it takes to produce results in others. Mm. So it's, it's obvious that when everybody assumes that just because you can chop, you can teach. And again, there's a financial incentive. There's, there's no penalty for 
the the website or drum teaching company that books fantastic players who maybe aren't the greatest at teaching because people still enjoy the experience. They still sell the tickets. Mm. So again, when you talk about the skin in the game, it's like if you had if you had a competitive, and I'm not saying that anyone should ever really do this, but if you had a reality show where you were mentoring 10 drummers at, at a fixed level and somebody else was mentoring 10 drummers and at the end of, at the end of 12 weeks they were going to have a competition and the one who improved their drummers most was going to get the prize, you would sure as hell see some way, way more adaptive teaching, at least after a few iterations of that when people realized mm. what worked and what didn't. And my guess is that you'd probably start to see a style of, of teaching that resembles much more closely what people do in real live or die situations w- with real objective criteria like sports particularly like combat sports which is bring some of this accelerated learning science to bear instead of just qwerty keyboard what qualities do you think people should look for in in a teacher or in a resource or like you know what what do you think is the most important thing um for developing your drumming that you would look for, you know, if you were, if you were trying to, trying to get better or trying to get someone's help. I think it's, it's some combination of, they do need to be legit like a, you or a Justin Scott. They, they have, they have to be someone who, who legitimately can play. That's, that's important. Mm. But if you, if you're a student looking to get the essence of what it means to be a, a good drummer, it's it's somebody that that has that that has that depth of groove and feel musical adaptability creativity and yes when they solo it sounds deliberate and clean and there are no Mm. buffering errors but it it doesn't have to be eric moore or andy prado uh respect to both of those guys sure and on the other side i'd i'd look for somebody who's Who's number one? Whose teaching methodology sounded interesting to me. So, before this call, I was sending you that interview with John Donaher, who you can just tell mm. gets it. Like mm. he he's just he's absorbed all the science. Like he's he's read Anders Ericsson, you know he he's read the um, the behavioral psychologist. He just he just knows his stuff, and, and he's thinking. Mm-hmm. The way he approaches it is is thinking in the in the sort of correct way rather than just sort of doing what everybody else has done or hodgepodge things. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I mean that may be a tall order, but but look, I think both you and I have attracted audiences by making those sort of noises. So there are people out there who are interested in that stuff. And then there are people out there who are gonna get better with us or without us through brute force so i think there Mm. is a select crowd who like they're the people who are going to benefit most from a coach they know enough to to differentiate a good approach from a bad one and they happen to come into our orbit the one thing that the guidance saves you is is time like yeah you could probably figure it out by yourself and you could probably um sort of yeah you could probably get there on your own with some really limited resource like a book or something but it'll just take you 10 times as long i think you know i've always found it strange that phenomenon of of people sort of like sort of declaring that they're like self-taught as this uh, it's this sort of people wear it as like a badge of honor but uh, and, and and I get that, you know, there's a certain sort of pride associated with sort of feeling like you're, you're self-made or whatever, but I don't know, all I can think when, when someone says that is like, yeah, m- imagine how much better you'd be now if you had someone to help you like that whole time where you were trying to kind of figure everything out, you know. Do you think that there's anything else that you want to touch on? Yeah, I, I, I think, I think we've covered it. I've sort of, had an informal structure in my head about this even though everyone does it the conventional way sucks for a lot of people well why why if it's been around so long does it suck we talked about the sort of game theory of mm-hmm. it and and the perverse incentives okay well what would a better way look like well there are multiple layers to that right so mm-hmm. 
one is the incentives for the teacher. The other is the qualifications of the teacher. Okay, well, why don't I just go take drum lessons with celebrity drummers? Well, it turns mm-hmm. out that being a great player doesn't necessarily mean being a great teacher, although it's being a decent to good player is a prerequisite, right? Um, mm-hmm. And then I think finally we've we've given people a little bit of a view into, all right, well, if we if we did strip away all the perverse incentives, what would a curriculum created by a teacher who's got maximum skin in the game and also decent expertise look like? Mm-hmm. At least, like, what principles would that person leverage to to get his or her students to the next level? Um, so, from from my from my uh, my perspective, I think we gave the the people their money's worth. Yeah, cool, man. Well, it's great to get your get your insight on this and chat to you about it. You know, if you haven't already, head on over to uh, Nate's channel, The 8020 Drummer, and drop a sub there. He drops fantastic videos. And uh, yeah, thanks for coming on, man. It was great to, great to chat with you. And uh, let's do it again sometime. Cool. Fantastic. Appreciate you having me on, Jacob. Awesome, man. Peace. Peace. <laughs>